Hello, hello. We are here today with Professor John Marini, a big, big shot in the field of mechanical ventilation and ARDS. Professor Marini is professor at the University of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Hi, John. Thank you for being with us. Hey, Jean-Louis. Pleasure to be here. My first question is, do we still need ARDS or should we try to dissect the syndrome and be more specific about the diseases which underlie the syndrome? My personal opinion, Jean-Louis, is that ARDS is useful as a general category. However, to personalize medicine, we need to specify what caused it, what stage it's at, and uh, what the principles of management are. And those are the things that the physician needs to keep in mind. Very good, I fully agree. Now, do we have any treatment of ARDS? For the specific diseases that ARDS is generated by, we may have uh, specific sure. uh, 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 treatments, but for the, the general problem, we need to let the lung heal itself, go through the phases of inflammation and re resolution. And most of the things that we do interfere with uh, those processes. They either create new, in, a new uh, damage or they prevent the healing of the old damage. So no place for corticosteroids? Well, depends on, depends on the stage and it depends on the, the etiology. If there's a high inflammatory uh, component uh, as indicated by various biomarkers, then yes, I, I think that it's reasonable to try steroids. But we, um, we should start relatively early. If we, if we look at the North American study of the RDS network, when they started late, it was not so good? Well, I think you know my feeling about, <laughs> about uh, general population-based studies to try to guide bedside practice. I think yeah. steroids have, have, have helped me many, many times hemodynamically as well as uh, to, to cool down the inflammation when it's present. Not in everyone, but in some. Very good. Let's speak about uh, ventilatory support. Um, mechanical ventilation, tidal volume of 60 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, and uh, a peep of uh, 5 to 12. Very easy, isn't it? Do you agree? <laughs> of course I don't. Yes, I think you know that I do not. Um, certainly the principles involved there are very good. Uh, the driving pressure is very important. The strain of the individual cycle, so long as it's above a threshold of injury, uh, that's a very important principle. And the tidal volume interacts with how big the baby lung is to determine the driving pressure. Uh, so would you look at tidal volume first or driving pressure first? I, I would set generally a tidal volume that gives me a, an acceptable uh, P PACO2 ventilation uh, strategy. So it, usually it's in the range of six to 10 even uh, milliliters per kilogram ideal body weight. And then from that point, settle for the, the, the PEEP level, the lowest PEEP level, which will maintain adequate oxygenation without impairing hem hemodynamics. Um, so a rather limited PEEP level, that's the, that's the, the, the timely, the, the, the present concept, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I think that the idea of fully opening the lung and putting on a great deal of, of tension on, on the lung is probably not correct for most people, especially in the later phases of disease. And we found that in COVID. Uh, okay. Uh, now you say six to perhaps 10 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, but sometimes six perhaps may be too high or not? Yes, of course. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, I think COVID-19 ARDS showed us that very, very nicely. There, it's been shown many times before that there are hyperinflated pockets within the, the ARDS lung, but they're usually a minority of the number of lung units available. In COVID-19, it's often a majority when you're in the late phase of COVID-19. And for then, uh, even six ml per kilogram may be just a little bit too high, or we need to re reduce the, uh, the PEEP level, or we need to find another way to reduce the, 
the stress and strain on the lungs, such as a, a repositioning, even going flat rather than upright. And we've published a number of articles this year on that, uh, that, mm. that concept. Since you speak about over distension, should we use uh, CT scans more commonly or EIT to look at the uh, lung morphology? Well, you know, I don't really feel capable of saying that we always use a, a CT or we always use EIT. Do, do they make sense in concept for looking at regions? Yes, it, it, it does. Uh, they, they do make sense for looking at, re, at regional anatomy and for hyperinflation and, and collapse. However, uh, at the micro level, we don't have tools that are good enough at the bedside yet to determine that. And we're, we rely on looking at mechanics and the bedside clinician will do that. Yeah. Now, you and others uh, propose to use the concept of power and of course, Luciano Gattinoni like you is, uh, is behind this concept. It, it, perhaps it sounds a bit complicated to the average intensive care doctor. Can you explain us a little bit what this is about? Well, I'll, I'll try to do that quickly. Uh, power is the intensity of energy delivery. And it's important within each individual cycle. And it's important with the number of cycles delivered per minute. So currently we think of power as the energy delivered per minute, according to Luciano's original de definition. We've recently gone into the intracycle uh, power and intensity of energy delivery, which is fundamental to injury or to prevention of healing. And all of those factors, whether they be PEEP to increase strain, flow, which can, can uh, when it's excessive, distribute the power uh, unevenly, uh, and of course, the driving pressure. Those are the three main pressure components of the energy per cycle, and we think that's important. Now, I am at the bedside, John, and I, I'm a little lost here. I don't know what I should look at, how I should turn the knobs. Tell John, me, tell I, I, I doubt that very seriously, actually. <laughs> I think you're <laughs> probably very good at the bedside. Um, <laughs> Well, we, uh, when we talk about power, uh, the, 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 the simplest concept to remember is that we don't want to generate too much strain per cycle or too many cycles per minute. So if we have ways of reducing vulnerability, turning the patient to a prone position to even out the transpulmonary pressures so we don't overstrain certain areas, trying to uh, keep the uh, individual tidal volumes uh, within a, a range that will generate a driving pressure that's acceptable. Uh, and of course, the most important thing is to reduce the patient's own ventilatory demand. Yeah. In other words, of course, we learned that lesson with, with um, permissive hypercapnia, uh, tr try to reduce the minute ventilation level. So at the bedside, I look at minute ventilation, I look at driving pressure, uh, I look at the, the, the patient's effort and, of course, the parameters that we're trying to optimize, such as oxygenation. You mentioned prone ventilation. Do you think we should use it more often than we do now and even in moderate, not so severe cases? Very good question. Uh, I think if your team is, is capable of doing it easily and safely, then any patient who is deteriorating should definitely be tried in a prone position. Um, and, and if a patient is making progress slowly, even if they're, they're uh, making progress slowly, but are being ventilated with a, with a good pattern, I mean, a, a pattern that seems acceptable, I don't think it's necessary in everyone. It a, it's a, it's can be done safely, it can be done efficiently, but it's, it's often a, a little, uh, yeah, it may also depend on the risk. Uh, after abdominal surgery with brain, sometimes it's a bit, a bit complicated. Uh, would you use sedation liberally and paralysis liberally? Well, it depends if the patient is making extreme efforts. Uh, some people deny the fact that uh, the, the damage to the lung can occur with vigorous spontaneous efforts, p silly. I think that is wrong. I think that some patients who are breathing very vigorously 
have not only strains on the airway side, but also on the vascular side, which contribute to the problem. So if you can, if you can reduce the, the stresses and strains on the, the patient in another way, uh, light sedation uh, and the patient looks comfortable, I wouldn't worry about paralyzing such a patient. But if they are, are still very vigorously breathing, they have high ventilation requirements, I can't control the, uh, the, the um, driving pressure uh, and, and frequency uh, within my acceptable limits, then of course I would, I would paralyze. But not for, as lo not for any longer than I, than's necessary. You test it periodically. Okay. Recruitment, regularly, seldom, never, always. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're in trouble, yeah, there, there is, it's, it's very interesting to look at the literature and see that some people have advocated opening the lung completely always uh, as much as possible until the patient get, gets better. That may work for some, but other people such as Paolo Pelosi and, and uh, Patricia Rocco have put provocative papers out there that say, let's rest the lung completely. And Didier Dreyfus long ago said, should we recruit or should we rest the lung. I think probably some combination of both the, the parameters which will allow the oxygenation and, and ventilation uh, to be optimized or to be acceptable is probably what we should target. And anything further than that, I don't think we're helping the lung. We're probably impeding the healing of the lung. So my last question, with, with, with all of that, do you think that we can still reduce Vili, ventilator-induced lung injury, further, can we still hope to see a reduction in mortality rate in prospective randomized control trial by doing a little bit more or a little bit left, less of this or that? Jean-Louis, I think probably we can do a little bit, but not much more. Uh, the, the driving, if we keep the driving pressure acceptable, try to minimize the threshold or actually maximize the threshold for further injury uh, and, and not uh, excessively ventilate the lung beyond what we really need to do. I think that's the best that we can do. Now, are there other factors? Yes, there are other factors. We found that temperature, blood flow, uh, other things that physicians don't pay much attention to at the bedside, even, even flow profile. Those are maybe secondary to the strain per cycle and the number of cycles per minute, but they're still important. You will and tell us more about it next March in Brussels, right? I Thank sure, you. I sure hope so. Wonderful. Thank you very you. much, John. This was very helpful, very interesting. Have a good day, my good friend. Take you care. Too. Have a ciao, good day. Bye. Bye.